alaikum for the brothers and sisters who are in Islam. What's happening for the brothers and sisters off the street, for the nationalists, free to land, and uh, whatever, you know. Yeah, hotel. Yes. Uh, this is a very important topic, uh, M Hotel, the African origin of Western architecture. Because uh, not many of us growing, growing up, going to school, were taught that Africans had anything at all to do with architecture. And in spite of the fact that over and over, time and time again, we have demonstrated our thorough and exacting methods of building and constructing buildings, no one ever bothers to write about it. And so when you look at the Tuskegee architects and the architects that built most of the black colleges down south, when Robert Taylor and the Tuskegee architects began to design buildings there, they had the largest freestanding dome, in the, in, not in the country, but in the world, larger than St. Peter's. But you can't find that in one book on architecture, not one book that I've seen in all the schools of architecture that I've studied and libraries that I've gone to, books that I've checked out, bought. I've never seen once mention about the feats of these particular architects. Here in America, most of the, the uh, buildings in America, the colonial buildings, were built by Africans. The, the so-called slaves are the ones that built the buildings for George Washington, Monticello for Thomas Jefferson. All the buildings that you see that are monumental structures here in this country, African people are the ones who built those structures for the so-called uh, slave masters. But yet, we don't get credit for being uh, the thorough and exacting builders that we have been traditionally. Very, very few of us know about Benjamin Banneker and how this brother was able to, to after uh, uh, Charles Elephant, who was uh, commissioned by George Washington and Thomas Jefferson to design the Capitol, he was engaged with the argument and ran back to France with the plans. But young Banneker was able to recall in his mind, not young Ban Banneker at this time, he was up in age, but he was able to recall in his mind the complete plan. And it is, a reason, it is for that particular reason that DC is laid out the way it is because of the brilliant memory of Benjamin Banneker. But nobody teaches that to us in the schools. Our children going through elementary school, junior high school, high school, university system, the injustice system, the miseducation system, they never learn about these feats of our ancestors. And Lord knows they don't tell us that we had ancient civilizations back in ancient Kemet, which we call Egypt today, and Ethiopia, and, and Ghana, and Songhai, the great civilizations in West Africa. Africans have had a long history, the longest history in the world, of building structures and buildings. And so since the universities, the professors with their PhDs, and we always like to say, you know, when we get our, B our BS degree, that's, you know, what that is, the, the, the bullshit degree. I know there's a few kids here, but they're going to have to learn some of these words and know how to use it with discretion sooner or later. And you get the MS degree, which is the more shit degree, and then, and then you get the PhD, which is the power high and deep degree. So they go through and they get all these degrees, but none of them, none of them have the wherewithal or the heart to stand up and tell the truth about African people. And so since the PhDs at Berkeley, UCLA, Harvard, and Yale and Princeton and all these schools, uh, yeah, even the Morehouses and the, uh, and the, uh, the uh, Voyees and the black schools back south like Alabama State, even those people who, who are African by nature are not teaching on this subject because they won't do it. Here comes a brother from South Central LA to do it for them. That's why we like, that's why we love Malcolm. You know, you know, this is a this is a this is a good time because, irrespective of how we feel about the movie, the fact that people are engaged with in dialogue about this brother, and because it will encourage uh, scholarship on the brother, this is a good thing if nothing else. The fact that we'll be able to talk about this brother, and so let me begin by saying, uh, categorically, that had not been for this brother here, what you're about to see tonight wouldn't wouldn't exist. It wouldn't happen. Because when I was going to when I was going to school, they used to have me painting murals of black discoverers and C Christopher Columbus and Ponce de Leon and Magellan and all these different people who were supposed to Columbus who were supposed to discover people and discover places, discover all kinds. Even though people are living here, you know, I have a lecture on the African presence in America before Columbus, so maybe one day we'll come back and do that. Uh, but nonetheless, he's supposed to discover things. All these people are supposed to discover things of people are already there. But they don't tell us about the vast civilizations here in the Americas that predate Columbus, where they had zero and all types of advanced mathematics, uh, striking uh, chords to the temples, to the stars, and these other things. They never tell us about that and how the, the uh, Spanish brutally brutalized the Native Americans and burned 5,000 at one, one place. 
down in, uh, in, in the Yucatan Peninsula at one time, burned 5,000 of them, yet they'll tell us that uh, they were coming in the name of Christianity and so forth and so on, yet they would turn around and do this kind of hideous thing. So we know these people have a long history of, of telling uh, his story. And so tonight we want to get into our story. So one of the things I want to bring to your attention here is some of the recent ar articles that have come out, like this one here is, is, is over a year old now, but it, they asked the question, uh, was Cleopatra black? Fairly irrelevant question, but, but they asked it uh, nonetheless. And then this article came out recently in September of this year, Egypt and the Rise of Greece. And I just want to share with you uh, their feelings on this particular subject. Now, they categorically denied that, uh, that Egypt, not only that Egypt, they say, had no real major impact on Greece, but also that the ancient Egyptians weren't black. Now, Martin Bernal, who was a professor out of uh, Cornell University and formerly of uh, Cambridge in, in uh, England, he wrote a book that today is a topic of much discussion. It's called Black Athena, the Afro-Asiatic Roots of Classical Civilization. And in this particular book, Bernal argues that the ancient Egyptians categorically, for, for the most part, were black people. And this was, a, this, was a, this was a shift all the way to the so-called left, because Bernal is considered to be an insider. What I mean by that is that he, he's come up in the academic world in which people have developed a model of history that says that white folks have basically created and done everything. And so Bernal's grandfather, a man by the name of uh, Alan Gardner, wrote the definitive text on Egyptian language and literature and also a number of other texts such as uh, uh, Egypt of the Pharaohs, which is a chronology of Egyptian kingdoms. And so he was, a, he was one of those people who were involved in what Mark Bernal calls the Aryan model of history. And in this Aryan model of history, what they're saying is that, that, that the Egyptians had a very, uh, a, a very slight, if any, uh, uh, impact on the development of Greek civilization. And they more or less take the position that Greece is a monolith, that is, that Greece was developed in and of itself, a monolith of pure European development and culture. This is the position of the extreme Aryan model. Well, so Bernal as an insider took exception to this, and this is what has caused so much commotion. But let's say that but Bernal is not doing anything new because long before Martin Bernal began talking about uh, his black Athena, we had William Leo Hansberry, Africa and Africans as seen by classical writers. I can't find it, the legendary work, the work of work. The Stolen Legacy by, by George G.M. James, brother who was hideously murdered for writing the truth. And so uh, since this brother was murdered for writing the truth, it's the least that we can do is pick up the book that this brother laboriously put together for us to read and to tell us about, and, and to know in certain terms, that not only the Greeks, but the Romans, all of the, all the Western civilization has lied to black people. Because anytime someone takes something from you and does not declare, in fact, that he's borrowed it from you, then, in fact, that becomes theft. And so he appropriately titled this book, Stolen Legacy. And of course, we can't, we can't forget the master who recently passed in the last, last four years, I suppose, but Sheikh Anta Diop, who book, a legendary book. Yeah, Sheikh Anta Diop. All these brothers deserve a, a round of applause. And uh, Civilization and uh, Barbarism is a very important book. In fact, this book is very much in line with some of the information that you, I'll be sharing with you uh, this evening. So I just wanted to cover a few of those things. And, and also a fairly decent book. In fact, it's the only book that I can see is really dedicated totally to Imhotep. It's by a, by a European or of descent, uh, Jameson Hurry, a book that's on Imhotep. So I, recognize, I, I recommend that you do read this book because it does highlight the life of Imhotep and some very important things that you should know about this brother, which we will be sharing with you today. So now back to the article. Well, just to, to sum it up, what the, I'm not going to read the whole article, I'll just sum it up. What they're saying in this archaeology magazine is that uh, this concept of Afrocentricity is nothing more than the emotional position of black people with some wild-eyed expectations about the past, and that uh, for some reason black people can't su submit their, their passion to reason, and that this whole concept of Afrocentricity is nothing more than emotionalism, and that black people are trying to latch on to a history that does not belong to them. That's the position that they have taken in these particular articles. And so, uh, you know, I take exception to that. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you categorically, you know, in certain terms, that not only is, that, is, is, is ancient Kemet or Egypt an African civilization, but that the very essence of architecture that led to the development of high-rise architecture such as skyscrapers, all, it all 
had its origins and evolution in, along the Nile Valley amongst the indigenous people, the indigenous Africans, who are commonly called the ancient Egyptians. And so one of the things that we'll be pointing out in this lecture is mathematics. We'll be showing you how mathematics developed naturally along the banks of the Nile River. And it is Africa itself, its geological, topographical, and geographical aspects of Africa that are responsible for the origin and evolution of what we call geometry today. Ge geometry literally means earth measurement. And it was along the banks of the Nile as a process of, of inundations and subsi subsiding of inundations that they began to measure the land, to measure the earth, the first concept of, of earth measurement, which we call geometry today. We also will be speaking about the Greeks and Romans and how they learned uh, these things from Egyptian masters. And we'll see the oral accounts given by the Greeks themselves who said they learned from the ancient Egyptians there in Africa. Also, we'll be dealing with the oral tradition of the Greeks, as well as the extensive archaeological information that comes down to us by way of uh, the, uh, the, the, the ruins of structures that go all the way back to the very earliest uh, European high culture, which is the island of Crete and, and the, and the uh, Mycenaean civilization just off the coast of, uh, of ancient Greece, so-called ancient Greece. And so without any further ado, we'll have the uh, lights, and uh, we'll get into this uh, very important topic, Imhotep and the African origin of, of Western architecture. Okay, this first, uh, this first slide is a uh, sculpture of the god, which we call, or Netur, which we call correctly, Ptah. Ptah is said to be the great architect of the universe. He is the one who uttered and brought forth the creation. He is considered to be the great mind. And Ptah, as the creation, the Memphite theology story tells the story of Ptah. Ptah rose up in the form of a primeval hill and uttered, and from, his in, from, from the core of his in, inside, uttered forth life. He called forth Atom, fire. And fire emerged, and from fire all life was created. Now, it's interesting because uh, in the later dynastic period of Kemet, the, and of course we know there's approximately 30 dynasties in, in Kemet. Or, when, when I say Kemet, I want everyone to impress in their minds that Kemet is synonymous with Egypt. Kemet is a term that the ancient Egyptians, one of the terms that the ancient Egyptians called their land, Kemet. They also called their land Tameri. Tameri means the birth land, the born land. Kemet means black land. Kemet Ta is black land. Kemet Nu is black nation. And Kemet Tu is what they call themselves the black people. So we use the indigenous names whenever we can because one of the things the Europeans have always done was to come in and change names. And this is why the X is there for Malcolm, Malcolm X. Because X represents the ex-slave. He's no longer uh, going with the white man's name. He, he get, he's getting rid of it, and this is his X. And so he receives his X until the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, or God, names him. That's what the Muslim does. He receives his X. You hear one X and two X, brother so-and-so, three X, brother X. X just simply means ex-slave, no more slave. So we're no longer slaves here, so we're going to use the Kemetic uh, names, wherever, indigenous names, whenever possible. You think that's what we ought to do? Yeah. And this is like a church, you know, so you can, any time you want to respond, Amen. you know, it's okay, you know. <laughs> All right. So here's Ptah. And so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in terms of the religion. We will be doing the, the Egyptian temple mother of the Christian church on December 27th for the Lone Beach Study Group. And you can get information from the brother on the camera afterwards about that. And in that lecture, we go into religion. And we analyze the Bible. We analyze the book of Revelation. And we show how a lot of this information was taken directly out of the ancient Egyptian text, particularly the book of coming forth by day and by night, which they call the book of the dead. But we won't get too much into that tonight because we want to deal with the structure. So Ptah is considered the, the architect of the universe. And so in the later dynasties, Imhotep was called the son of Ptah. This brother was a multi-genius. He's the first brother to come down to us in history and recorded history as a multi-genius. You heard about Michelangelo and Bernini, and you heard about Alberti. You heard about, you heard about all those European so-called geniuses, but never did you hear about African genius. No one talks about the African genius, especially the first genius in recorded history, which is this brother, this ancient sage Imhotep. And you can see by his, his nose and his mouth, he doesn't look like Charleston Heston or Yule Brenner. He's no offspring of Elizabeth Taylor. Looking at his nose and lips, you can see that he looks just like your uncle. Looks like anybody you see here sitting in the room. Clearly showing you Imhotep is clearly an African. And this brother was the grand visor, a visor, under the pharaoh Zosin, the third dynastic period in Egypt, which is approximately 3,000 years BCE. Nearly 5,000 years ago, this brother walked on the face of the earth and was recorded as being a genius. 
This brother designed the first monumental stone structure known to man, the Step Pyramid for King Zosa. Now, you heard about the seven wonders of the world, the Light Tower of Alexandria, and you heard about the Hanging Tower of Babel, and the Rhodes Statue, and all the other stuff. You can't find any of it. It's all gone. But yet, the, one of the wonders, the pyramids of Egypt, are still there. The only wonders of the world that you don't have to wonder about are still there in Kemet. Right. This brother de designed the first one, and it's still there. You can walk right up and see it. 5,000-year-old monument sitting right there for you to come and see. So the brother, the brother was not only a, a, a great architect, as I say, he was a vizier, and that's just like being the uh, vice president or being in the cabinet. He was, a, he was next to the power, he was next to the pharaoh in power. This brother was an administrator in the kingdom of Kemet. The brother was a physician. That's right, the brother was a not only an architect and a governor, he was a physician. And, and the brother moved from a physician to a demigod and became a god later on. They worshiped him as a god. The Greeks and Romans worshiped him as a god. They called him Asclepius. And even today, when the, when the physicians swear to become a physician, they swear to this brother under the guise of Asclepius, M Hotel. So they need to have some doctors in here tonight. So Brother M Hotel was an astronomer. The brother struck the chord axes of his temples according to the stars in the heaven. Brother was recorded as being a royal astronomer. <laughs> brother M Hotel. All of our children should be raised with that brother's name on their lips. M Hotel. He who comes in peace. So this is Brother M Hotel here on the scene through Brother Lester O. Bankhead. Now, Lester O. Bankhead, a lot of you don't know about this brother, but this brother who is a brother I worked with for 10 years, sat at this brother's feet for 10 years. He was 66 years old when I met him. The brother is almost 90 years old, and he's still practicing architecture. This brother knew uh, Paul Williams and, he, and worked on several projects. In fact, in his office, I had the, the great fortune of working with him and a brother by the name of George Williams, who teaches architecture at Cerritos College. I worked on one of Paul Williams' buildings. Of course, in case some of you don't know who Paul Williams is, that brother designed a number of homes for so-called stars such as Frank Sinatra. But probably the most important thing that you can recognize him for was the design of the, of the uh, restaurant at LAX with the arches down there. But nobody told you that Paul Williams worked on that building, did they? So Brother Lester Bankhead, I sat at this brother's feet for 10 years, and the focus of our office was churches and motels, and I still think that they're related. But the majority of the work, <laughs> the majority of the work was on churches and motels. And so it was working on the churches with Brother Bankhead that I began to notice as I began to study ancient Kemet that there were certain canons in the architecture of the church that were consistent with the canons that were developed by our ancestors, namely Imhotep, when he received what they call the Book of Foundations from Almighty God Ptah, the Book of Foundations. In this particular book, which the ancestors said that was given to Imhotep from God, they built continuously for 3,000 years based upon the foundation book that was written by Imhotep. And it's coming down all the way to us today in the churches and cathedrals and basilicas throughout Europe, America, Asia, everywhere white folks have built a cathedral and basilica, the canon of those structures go all the way back to this brother who wrote the book of foundations. They'll tell you that it's, it's Marcus Vitruvius Polio who wrote the Book of Foundations, but they're lying, and I'm going to prove it to you before we get done here. So it was with this brother, working with this brother for 10 years, that I began to see the canons of our ancestors incorporated into the churches that we were designing even for our own people. See, we were the poor folks architects, as Bankhead always liked to say. The brother always had work. A lot of architects was hungry, coming starving, coming in the office, and they say, Brother Bankhead, how do you keep so much work? Brother Bankhead was as much a philosopher as he was an architect. Brother Bankhead says, uh, well, I'm a servant of the people. Have you ever heard tell of a servant being out of work? He would say things like that. He would say things like there's no such thing as time. Something that our ancestors understood when the Dogon began to knot the ropes to count time for the ceremony, which they called the Siki Tolo, that takes place every 60 years. Sometimes they knew they wouldn't be alive to see the ceremony, but they kept on knotting that rope preparing for that ceremony because they knew that someday their son would be able to perform the ceremony. They knew there was no such thing as time, there's no such thing as death, that African people are perpetual and everlasting. 
This is a philosophy that this brother taught me for 10 years before I stepped out of his office and stepped into the world of ancient Kemet. We move on. And so you can see here that there were many triads in Kemet, and you see Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, or Jehovah. Well, this is where these concepts are coming from. As you can see, Horus on the, what is that, on your left? And Osiris, or Asar, Heru, let's do it right, Heru to your left, Asaru in the center, and Aset to your, to your right. Aset being Isis, Asaru being Osiris, and Heru being Horus. This was the first, well, not the first, one of the most important triads or trinities in ancient history. And so Imhotep was so tough that he got to be a part of a trinity. As you can see, Ptah here, and Imhotep in the center, and Selkmet here, he was said to be the son of Ptah and Selkmet, Imhotep. The, brothers, the legend about the brother grew so much over 3,000 years that he was walking with the gods in the universe. This is how powerful this brother was. And this is a sign and a symbol to our children that someday, yeah, little Kevin, someday, little Tom Mary, someday, little Sonny Jr., y'all can walk in the heavens and the universe with the ancestors and the gods. If you visualize it, you can do it. And Imhotep is the proof. We move on. The Masons know it. The Masons know it. Right. See, y'all driving down Wilshire, looking to your right, looking to your left, never looking up to see what's on the wall. Can't see the stars now for the street lamps out on the street. I'm just I'm not teasing. I ain't mean y'all. I'm talking about, you know, the mother folks outside didn't come here tonight. <laughs> because, uh, you know, y'all, I'm glad y'all didn't go to the club to get down and get funky tonight and come in here to seek knowledge and wisdom with us who are seeking knowledge and wisdom here this evening. But the, the Masons got right here on Wilshire. This is a, what we call architectonics. Architectonics is when you design a theme right into the building. And what they've designed here on the roof here, the roof, the projection of the roof is symbolic of Frank Lloyd Wright, a man who was known for his roof projections. This represents modern architecture. Around the side of the building here, we're going to go here and show you a little close-up. On the side of the building here, you can see Imhotep right there on Wilshire. They don't even use his Greek name, got his African name, Imhotep. So-called Negroes driving right by and don't even know the brother, see the brother right here and dread it, the brother Zosa got dreadlocks like Bob Marley, sitting right on Wilshire. You're on your way to work with so much stress on you, trying to get there to do the nine to five, and can't even see the brother on the wall on Wilshire. But the Masons are saying that this brother represents the first monumental st structure known to man, the, fr the first masonry, the first great builder, which they call Merkep. That's what they call the architects in Kemet, the Merkep, the ones who struck the core on the sacred ground. So the Merkett Imhotep is right on Wilshire, and then the architectonic expression is saying that it's from the Africans that architecture began. Going down to Hammurabi and the Babylonians, and on down to the Greco-Roman world, and Christopher Wren at the end of the building, where Christopher Wren designed over 52 churches in England after the Great Fire. And we turn the corner today, brothers, sisters. We turn the corner, and there's old George standing there. And old George with the Capitol building, D.C., in the background, showing you that even D.C. has to go back and pay homage to Imhotep. Imhotep and the African origin of Western architecture. So we're going across from George. We can see here on the back of the building as we turn the corner, oh, Albert Pike here. Albert Pike, a Freemason who wrote a very important book on Freemasonry. We ain't going to get into that too much. But I'll suffice it to say that old Albert Pike, Pike said the day the Negroes or the put it in his own words, the day the niggers joined the lodge is the day I leave. That's what, that's what Albert Pike said. And if I can't back that up, I'll eat all these slides, eat this stick, eat the podium. But that's what he said. He said the day the niggers joined the lodge or the masons is the day that he'll leave. That's what he said. And so uh, sitting right behind him is the pyramid right behind him. <laughs> Let's go back. You got, let's go back. You got Imhotep here, who, who designed the first pyramid. You saw Imhotep. He didn't look like Charleston Heston and Ewell Brenner. And right behind his head is the pyramid. The pyramid showing that in architectonics that the pyramid builders of Kemet or Egypt gave birth to the Greco-Roman world, as you see the columns below the pyramid. 
architectural theme right behind the man that said he's going to leave the lodge when the niggas came in. We move on, and you can see this. This is the Scottish Rite Temple in Washington, D.C. That's the temple that's behind him. I didn't know that till I went to D.C. I said, dang, that's the temple behind old Pike's head. <laughs> so behind old Pike's head is a pyramid on top showing you the, the ionic columns here where Kemet or Egypt gave birth to the Greek or Roman world. You say, now, brother, you might be stretching this stuff. Brother Matthew, I don't believe you. Let's see. Let's, let's, let's chase this thing. Let's see. He even got the Sphinx out front to put a period, an exclamation point on it. The pyramids giving birth to the Greek or Roman world. Right there in Washington, D.C., the Scottish Rite Temple. So if that wasn't enough, if you just looked up when you went downtown, you would have noticed the step pyramid right on top of City Hall. Oh, man. Oh, man. They gave birth to the temple, the Greco-Roman world. What did, what did Pike say? I want y'all to tell me. What did he say? The day the niggas came, he's going to leave, right? The brother, well, he should never join. You see the step pyramid right there on top of City Hall? There it is right there. But this is just your wild-eyed Afrocentric concept. You can't subject your passion to reason, is what they say about us. The first monumental structure, the only one that you don't have to wonder about, finds his way on top of City Hall, got a mare sitting up, up, up there, and don't even know it itself, probably. Maybe he does. Nonetheless, it's there on top of City Hall. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> then you went right by the library. Oh. You didn't look up at the library. Some of us don't even go to the library. <laughs> I'm not talking about y'all, because y'all are in the bookstore. I know y'all go to the library. <laughs> but you can see the flame of wisdom, the sacred fire, where Greece and Rome received the flame and light from Kemet, the sun people. Well, you see the philosophers, Dante and Homer and all them down here, where they received their light from Egypt. This is called architectonics, when a theme is expressed in the architecture. We move on, walk through the door, look up. You'll see the Greek, where he has learned from the sun children, the Egyptians, right over the door as you walk in the library. Let's go down tomorrow, Saturday. You don't have to go to work. Go down there and check it out. We move on. We can see, you know, this one looked kind of weak here. They kind of softened it up. But I wanted to show you I'm in Nimhead and Thutmose and Tutmose and the kings. We're going to be showing you in a minute. Well, you can see, look at the jaw and the lips here, the prognathous jaw and thick lips. Looks just like your jaw when you were shaving this morning, brother. No European got no lip and no jaw like that. Come on now, wake up. USC, in the library, at USC. Just walk in the library, walk up the stairs, look to your right, and you'll see the, the naked Greek, the barren Greek. You said it, brother. I didn't say it. <laughs> Reaching back in all of his nakedness, trying to receive the flame, the same flame you saw on top of the library. Reaching back for that flame. They got a watered-down brother here, but get the message, where the skyscrapers of New York City, Chicago, and L.A. have to pay homage to the skyscrapers of ancient Kim. In USC, how many of y'all Trojans went to USC? <laughs> Never even looked at, there's some Trojans in the back. Didn't even look at the library when they walked in there. I'm not talking about y'all, I'm talking about the mother Trojans. <laughs> so here Thomas Cole in 1840, sitting there reflecting on the past, designing a church here, He's saying, man, I'm designing this church, and I know, because I'm a Freemason, that it goes all the way back to the pyramids of ancient Kemet. The, Mame the Mamesi birth houses that gave birth to the Greco-Roman temples, and it's even intricately woven in the church today. They said the Canaan's that came down from heaven that was given to Imhotep by the god Ptah, the very Canaan's that developed the concept of the primeval hill of the beginning is right in the church today. And we're not going to get too much into that today. We're going to have to deal with that on the 27th. So if y'all want to see that, y'all got to come see that, that lecture. But we're going to show you something strong nonetheless. So let's take a look at this thing.
because they're always trying to cut the map up and take Egypt out of Africa, put it in the Middle East. If that's the Middle East, where's the Middle West? <laughs> but here you can see Kim is sitting right here in Africa, the Nile River, 4,100 miles in length, starting in King Uganda, in Uganda, Tanzania, Zaire, surrounding the Great Lakes region, which is the source of the Nile, flowing down 4,100 miles through the Sudan, right through Ethiopia, on through Kemet or Egypt, and empties right into the Mediterranean. But they cut it right out of Africa and set us in the Middle East. And was the dot when he became president, Jimmy Carter went over there and saw him and said, gee, I didn't realize you were so dark. This is what Carter said. And Carter said to, to him, I'm the first pharaoh in 2,000 years. That's what he said. He said he's the first black person, first Nubian to return to the throne of Kemet in 2,000 years. And every time he came to America, he came and visited black folk before he went to the capital. You see why he didn't live too long. We move on. So you can see here the Nile begins where the ancient Egyptians said in heaven. They call this, lake, this land the Ta Netter land. Ta is land and Netter is God. The God's land. They call it Pane or Punt, the ancient land where the ancient ancestors and the gods came from. This was an intermediary boundary where the world of the living communed with the world of the departed. People who lived in this particular area were considered to be the spiritual ancestors, the, the, the spiritual contact with the ancestors. The ancient Egyptians sent pilgrimages back to this land to replenish their own kingdom, and we're going to show you how they did that. But this place they called heaven. This was called the primeval hill of the beginning, as you see the mountains here. As you come up, you come into the highlands in Africa. This was the summit of the earth. The equator splits Africa in half. At this particular point, this is where the sun and, and the sun is equal day and equal night at the equator, the vernal autumn equinox. We ain't going to go into too much of that today, but suffice it to say, here you can see the story of Patel, who rose up in the form of a primeval hill. And that time, fire came and lived on top of the hill. This produced life. The geological processes in the interior of Africa, they said, produced life. See, the ignorant Europeans, they said the Egyptians had a lot of gods. They said it was a pantheon. But the ancient Egyptians, or the Kemetu, believed in the concept of one god from the very beginning. And they called the so-called gods netter. The word netter is where we get the word nature from. They said that before we were mortal men, we were netters. The ignorant Europeans said that they're saying that before they were mortal men, they were gods. But what the ancient Egyptians were saying is that before we were mortal men, we were H2O, water. We were helium. We were the very, the very silica, the earth, gab, the, the first concept of uh, chemistry. In fact, the word chemistry come from Kemet. The ancient Egyptians called the land Kemet. When the Arabs took over, they called it al -Kemet. They developed a science called alchemy. Right. And from alchemy, once they dro dropped the spiritual aspects of it, it became chemistry. Right. So the first chemistry was the so-called netters who represent the elemental forces of nature. Yeah. And the ancient Egyptians said, before we were mortal men, we were the elements of nature. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's a science. Right. They weren't worshiping a bunch of gods on the wall. It was a science. The concept of creation told in the story of Ptah. So here you can see the word Kemet means black, literally means black. Kemet Nu means nation. Kemet Ta, the people. Just in case you brothers and sisters didn't think Brother Matthew was telling the truth. Here you can see here this whole concept. I'm going to have to find that water, brother. I can't. I can find that water. But anyway, you can see uh, this whole concept of the primeval hill. The whole concept of the primeval hill right here. The hill rises up in the interior of Africa with over 40 volcanoes surrounding the Great Lakes region. And this black uh, earth, which they call Kemet, which they showed as a form of a black, born, a black burning rock, the symbol of Kemet, comes from the volcanic, volcanic activity here and the equatorial winds and rains, the inundation floods bring this black land, to, this barren desert, which is Egypt, to give life to this barren land. Without the floods from the interior, which is called heaven, where the god Ptah sets, there could be no life in Egypt. So they saw the god Ptah, the primeval hill, the earth maker, as they call it in the paylands, primeval paylands, 
the earth maker was creating the earth and sending it to Egypt. The God was. Can you see that? Is that clear? So here's a barren desert symbolized by Set. And this desert, could, you could not sustain life without this river bringing over 80 billion cubic tons of alluvium and topsoil, dropping it down into the Mediterranean. This is why the capital called Menefer, Menefer, which we call Memphis today, was dedicated to Ptah, the god, because it was here that you could see the gift of the god, Tameri, Ta's land and Mary's the born land. The gift of the land, Tameri, was deposited all over the place. And so this is where they built the monuments and testimonial to Ptah in Memphis. Now, see, white folks can't explain that. They can't explain that. They got to come up with some mystical, magical way of some spaceman came down and built the pyramid, or some Nordics came in from the north somewhere and built a civilization in Africa before they built one for themselves. Philanthropic white folks, we must understand that. Good nature people. <laughs> built a civilization before they built one for themselves, left and fell in the darkness until we came back and brought them back out of it again. This is the story they tell. So you can see it's because of that flooding, as the flood would come and deposit this land, the people would move up into the highlands and work on the monuments. It was a public works project. What no slaves, Jews building no pyramids? Those were craftsmen. Look at the when you see the architecture of those pyramids, this is extreme craftsmanship. It was a public works project. They went in the highlands and built the pyramids because of the flooding. And they mapped out the land using instruments to determine whose land was where after the inundation subsided. That was called earth measurement, which we call today geometry. The first concept of triangulation. Triangulation, was that attributed to Pythagoras? I'm going to answer all these questions here in a minute. As you see geometry, geometry means the measure of land. Ain't no Greeks measuring no land over there in those mountains up there on Mount Olympus. <laughs> this is where the earth measurement starts here. Pythagoras studied for 22 years in Kemet. Read Plutarch on Osiris and Isis. The Egyptians measured everything. We were obsessed with measurement and mathematics. You can see here the brothers measuring the gold, now white folks measuring the gold, took all the gold from us. We can't afford a little cheap gold chain. And they got jewelry stores from one end of the United States, Europe, all over, South Africa or Zania, taking the gold at one time we measured because it was in our land, in Africa. Rightfully belongs to us. Measured everything, even the soul, the heart, was weighed on the scale, on the balance. You had to come before to who he thought, and your heart had to be just and true. As you see St. Peter's, I'm, oh, we're not going to get into that today, but you see the key of life. Didn't St. Peter's have a key? Well, here you can see the key of life where the deceased is coming before the scales, before Osiris, where the heart is being weighed against the feather of truth. They weighed everything. Everything was dealing with mathematics and science. So we move on. We can see here at the great temple of Amun and Karnak, going all the way back in its foundation from the 12th dynastic period, all the way through the New Kingdom, all the way up to, to the present, where you can still go, as I did and took this picture, you can see Roman numerals before the Romans. Here you can see the area of a circle. How many of you knew that they were involved in the area, area of mathematics? How, how many of you knew that? The area of a circle. Look at the, the Ryan Mathematical Papyrus here. The area of the circle. The area of a square. Ryan Mathematical Papyrus. You can probably get it right here in the bookstore. Can you get that here, brother? Here you can see the, here you can see the, the area of a triangle. They're figuring out the area of triangles here in Kemet. And look at the heretic writing here. This is not even, this, see they have three different types of writing. We get into that, sister. We get into that. We move on, and then after they figured out the area of the triangles, they built triangles. Right there, and then they tell us Pythagoras was the father of the law of triangulation, which they called him, named it after him, Pythagorean theorem. And we got triangles sitting right there, the biggest triangle you ever saw. They can't see it. We move on, and here you can see the volume of pyramids, the volume of truncated pyramids. Diop in Civilization and Barbarism showed that the Mesopotamians tried to come up with a formula for the volume of a truncated pyramid. And it was wrong. And they always telling us how advanced the, the Mesopotamian mathematics was. They never show you a single example of it. Just tell you that. We move on. Here you can see, wait a minute. 
let's get the focus here. Here they are squaring numbers. Squaring numbers. Now, what's the basis for Pythagorean's, Pythagoras' theorem? Isn't it square roots? Isn't it squaring numbers? Here's the basis of it, the squaring of numbers. This is the Berlin papyrus here, the Moscow papyrus, rather. So don't tell me, don't say Brother Mathu is making this stuff up, that Brother Mathu can't subject his passion to reason. Because you can see Pythagoras coming into Kemet. We well, studied for 20, he said it himself. He studied for 22 years in Kemet. Then he went and studied 16 years in Mesopotamia and went back to Greece and started a school of mathematics. Then they said he was the father of the theorem. Just like they said Hippocrates was the father of medicine. You saw him, Hotep. They made him the god of medicine. And the only first thing you hear of Hippocrates, he's in Egypt studying medicine. <laughs> so apparently, the, the writers of this article in archaeology, uh, uh, who's saying that Egypt and the rise of Greece, who said that we were just being emotional, apparently they didn't see the Rhine mathematical papyrus and the sculptures of Imhotep. Let's move on here. It's a same slide here. So take a look at this thing here. So here you got some sisters on the wall in Kemet. Corn rolls, the white folks ain't walking around except Bo Derek, she copied it for a little while. But you don't see them walking around with corn rolls. This is an African hairstyle. Now here you can see the sisters with their melanin in their skin. Now when the National Geographic and the Epigraphic Society gets through with them, this, this is what the sisters look like. So they're saying that we're trying to latch on to somebody else's history. Am I trying to latch on to someone else's history, or are they trying to latch on to my history? It's a question. We move on. Here you can see the sisters here in Kemet. Right, this is in this is in Kemet, in the hotel in Aswan. The sisters standing here, you can't tell them apart. And and this is what happened to the sister here in National Geographic. So even the Arabs in Kemet know the sister was black. They put her in the hall in the lobby of the hotel. But we're not being objective here. They saw this, Ramesses and Tutankhamun, the various pharaohs had these headrests. They said, headrests? That can't be, oh, it, was just a, it was just a symbolic thing then. They just dismissed it. Then you go right to the interior of Africa and you see the brother laying up here with the headrest. <laughs> then you go back to the headrest here and you see, well, this brother took this brother two years to grow this hairstyle. He wasn't going to get his hairstyle up, so he made that headrest. <laughs> so Diop showed the cultural unity of black Africa. You can get that book here, I know. The cultural unity of black Africa. Where Ramesses is staring face to face with the ancestral land. So was Cleopatra black? Now, Cleopatra is a fairly insignificant queen, in my opinion. And it's really a queen that I'm not really interested in and claiming for her blackness. Sleeping around with those varmints like she was. But maybe there was some strategy behind it, I don't know. But since they want to raise the question, since they want to raise the question about whether or not she was black, she was perceived as being black until the last 200 years when the Aryan model of history came on the scene. Even in medieval Europe, Shakespeare and all the rest of the writers, Balponi, Ben Johnson, they considered this woman to be black. She was considered to be black because the tradition of the ancient Egyptians was black even in medieval Europe. So you go right to medieval Europe, you see Cleopatra here shown as being black. So apparently when he wrote this article, he didn't see the do the research that I was doing. He's from Harvard, Yale, Princeton. I'm from South Central. I can find stuff that he can't find. Then he couldn't find Shakespeare when Shakespeare wrote in his Anthony and Cleopatra, I am with phobias, amorous, pinches, black. I am darkened by the sun's touches. Then he writes, Cleopatra's description of herself is, of course, not to be taken too literally. <laughs> Since he raised the question, I wasn't really going after her because there's so many other great queens like Amosi Nefertari, and Nefertari, the queen of Ramesses II and Queen Hatshepsut, and Queen T. Oh, you can go on down the line. There's plenty of queens for us to claim to be African, besides the last one, Cleopatra the seventh out of seven of them. We move on. So here you can see the sister here, dark, phobias, amorous, pinches, black, 
touch, touch skin touched by the sun's rays, but National Geographic can't see it that way. This is what happened to the system, National Geographic. So these are the authorities, the so-called authorities on our history. They're the, they're the ones, that, the curators in New York, and the Cairo Museum, and the Metropolitan Museum of this, and the Metropolitan Museum of that, who teach all of this mis misinformation to our children and to ourselves. We move on, we can see here, then Bernard comes out with the book, Afro-Asiatic Roots of Classical Civilization, and every, all hell breaks loose. But here, we've been studying this stuff for years, long before we even knew who this guy was. They just ignore black scholars, ignore black architects, ignore anything that has to do with black people until white folks start talking about it. Then all of a sudden it becomes a valuable topic for discussion. Went to UC Riverside, they had a whole two panels, white folks on two panels debating about Bernal. One group represented the Aryan model of history, the other group represented the ancient model that said the Egyptians were black, all of them were white. It was an Asian girl that got me down there who saw one of my lectures at Brentwood High School. It was for all, before all white people. It was 800 white people there. And they went back and forth, arguing back and forth about whether or not the Egyptians were black. Then after that, I did the lecture, and everybody shut up. <laughs> they were coming over to me, apologizing. And the Asians, the Asians ran over. There was a bunch of Asians in there. It was right after the, after the uprising, at the shut up down. You know, they came over, and they said, Brother, I don't, I never, they said, I've never seen anything like this. They were just all excited. That was blowing me over. Yeah. Asians had never seen anything like this before. So this is the Aryan model of history. Uh, Howard Carter, James Henry Breston, all these cats got together and decided that they're going to write the black man out of history. The last 200 years, the last 200 years we have been written out of the history books. These are the ones who have written the books, who have written the foundation of the racist material that is throughout the educational system here, throughout the United States and Europe, all over, including in Africa, using the same textbooks from these people who are supposed to be scholars. So here I am from South Central. I want you to see uh, the, the information. We're just getting warm here. I want you to see this here. OK, here is a George Rawlinson on his book on Egypt, History of Egypt. He's, he writes about Amosi Nefertari. Her name, they call her, sometimes she's called a masses, but a Mosi is more appropriate, uh, to, so I'll be calling her a Mosi Nefertari. Nefertari Amosi, or the beautiful, companion of Amosi, King Amosi, okay, and who is represented on the monuments with pleasing features, but a, com but, but, a, a, but a complexion of ebon blackness. It is certainly wrong to call her a negress. <laughs> she, she was an Ethiopian of the best physical type. And her marriage with Amosis may have been based upon a political motive. Egyptian, he even gives it up. Egyptian pharaohs from time to time allied themselves with the monarchs of the South, partly to obtain the aid of Ethiopian troops in their wars, partly with a view, partly with a view of claiming uh, in right of their, of their wives' dominion over the, upper, of, over the upper Nile. So he's saying that he's admitting that the Egyptians married black women, Ethiopians, and they were not that they weren't black themselves. They reached back and got women from the South to marry these women. He says they were Ethiopian, but they weren't Negresses. OK. So what we're talking about here is some black white people, is what we're talking about. But I'm, I'm being emotional, and I want to latch on to somebody else's history. This is what he's teaching us. So he goes on. His madness continues on. But he, he goes on to talk about her. A, mo a, a mostly, uh, commemorated upon uh, his uh, monument during her, son's, uh, re during her son's reign. She held for a time, at any rate, the reign of power while, while in after ages she was venerated as ancestress and founder of the 18th dynasty. In other words, she was seen as the ancestress, the founder of the entire 18th dynasty. Now, for those of you who don't know it, the 18th dynasty was the most brilliant period in Kemetic history. They built the most monumental structures in terms of temples and architecture has ever been known in the world. Today, to this, to this day, the great temple of Amun at, at Apet Asut, or Waret, which we call Karnak today, that's still today the largest temple in the world, built in the 18th dynasty, the most important aspects of it. So she was the ancestors of that entire dynasty. In his own words, the successor of Amosi was, the, was his son by this Ethiopian princess, Amenhotep. So Amenhotep was the son of this queen the founder of the 18th dynasty. 
This is why she couldn't be a negress. So we move on. He goes on. This is this cat is something else. This is a George Rawlings. The Egyptians appear to have been among the darkest races with which the Greeks of the early times came into direct contact. Herodotus calls them blacks. But this is an extreme exaggeration akin to that by which all the native inhabitants of Hindustan have been termed niggers. Yeah, see? They've been termed niggers. The monuments show that the real complexion of the ordinary uh, Egyptian man was brown <laughs> with a tinge of red, a hue not very different from that of the cop. This is psychopathic racism, madness. There's a man that's sitting here looking at black people. Look at yourself, brown, black, all different colors. It says that uh, because you said we're exaggerating it when we call them black, because that's like calling everybody niggers or something, is what he's saying. But this is a scholar. This is an Egyptologist, a man who is renowned and respected in his craft as an Egyptologist. This is no lightweight. These are the guys that do the digging and do the writing in which the historian comes over with a general view, takes his information, and then writes it into the history books. A cop is, a, is another black person living in Egypt. That's the present, that was the, basically it's a religion, the Coptic religion, and basically people call cops as a result of that. But it's nothing no more than an extension and a re, uh, reorganization of some earlier principles, really in Christianity, in the form of Christianity. Well, the basic cult of the cop up until recently has been black and brown. And so he says they were, I'll show you that in a minute when we see Al Jahits, who, who in the, uh, who in the uh, back in Persia, uh, during the conquest of the, uh, the Arabs, he clearly showed the cops were also black. We move on, we can see here. In fact, here's Al Jahis right here. Now see, this is, this is something because, you see, this is before the Aryan model. We're talking about around the 7th century, to between the 7th century and the 12th century, you find that they uniformly saw the Egyptians even then as being black. And so this man here wrote a book called The, the, Histor the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Story of the Blacks Over the Whites, which, which uh, at this time, the, the whites were bragging and the Arabs were bragging about themselves. And so this man, al Jahit, who became the father of Islamic literature, look it up in the, Encycl in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Ja uh, Jahit wrote this book, the glory, of the, blacks, the glory of the Blacks Over the Whites. And in this particular book, he was defending his own self right in Persia, in the midst of all these people who were bragging. This is how much nerve this brother had. And this became the definitive work on the subject. He says the number of blacks is greater than the number of whites because most of those who are counted as whites are comprised of the people of Persia, the mountains, uh, Khorasan, Rome, Slavia, France, and Iberia. And anything apart from them is insignificant. He goes on to say, but among the blacks are the cops. That's Jahis. He's black in Persia, right now. Are the cops, the Nubians, the Zakawa, the Moors, the people of the Zen, the Hindus, the, the Kama the Dabila and the Chinese and those uh, beyond them. The sea is more extensive than the land and the islands in the sea between China and the land of the, of the Negroes are full of blacks. Here's a man who was traveled. He knew that the southeast part of Asia, which they call China in antiquity, and on into the Melanesian islands and, and Papua New Guinea, all out in the South Pacific, was full of blacks. And this is what he's writing. He's putting all these people into the same class. And then, so this is, man, we're talking about way before the Aryan model came on the scene. So we move on. We can see uh, a Petrie, Flinders Petrie, writing in his book, Religion and Conscience, talking about the ruling race of the Egyptians. He says the ruling race is akin to the type of people of Punt. I showed you Punt with those mountains in the interior of Africa. The divine land. It seems most probable that the dynastic Egyptians entered the Nile Valley at Coptos from the Red Sea. He goes on, he says there's a Mes Mesopotamian type there in Egypt also. He's digging up the archaeological finds here and the anthropological finds. He goes on to say, thirdly, there's a coarse type of mulatto appearance, and as, and as it is certain anatomically that there is much Negro blood in the oldest Egyptians. We have one element of the mulatto in evidence. He's saying that, what is a mulatto? So he uses ambiguous terms. And, what, and how much is much Negro blood? How much is that? Is that you? How much Negro blood do you have? as compared to a person in Zimbabwe, as a person in Uganda, as a person in Kenya. How much Negro blood do you have? Do you have much or do you have little? <laughs> See, you gotta, we got to start analyzing this psychopathic stuff these people have in these books. But nonetheless, he's seemingly admitting that at least two-thirds of the population that he was digging up here 
were clearly African. He had to say that because here's the findings. In the quad Egyptian pre-dynastic tombs and early dynastic tombs, you can see here, these are all Nubians. Nubians, the, the New Kingdom Nubians, C group Nubians, A group Nubians, B group Nubians, all Nubians, Abyssinians. The ancient Egyptians fit in the same category as all these Africans. Anatomically, they were the same. So this is what he was saying. So are we trying to latch on to somebody else's history, or are they trying to latch on to our history is the question. We ain't done yet. So Bernal goes on and writes, if Europeans were treating blacks, this is Mark Bernal and his black Athena, if Europeans were treating blacks as badly uh, as they did throughout the 19th century, blacks had to be turned into animals, or at best, subhumans. The noble Caucasian was incapable of treating other fuel humans in such ways. This inversion sets the scene for the racial and main aspect of the Egyptian problem. If it had been scientifically proved that blacks were biologically incapable of civilization, how could one explain ancient Egypt, which was inconveniently placed on the African continent? <laughs> there are two, or rather three, solutions. First was to deny that the ancient Egyptians were black. The second was to deny that the ancient Egyptians had created a true civilization. And the third was to make doubly sure by denying both. The last has been preferred by most 19th and 20th century historians. They just deny both of them. <laughs> but we all emotional and everything and trying to make up a, a civilization, trying to make up some history for ourselves. We move on. He goes on to state, this is Bernal continuing, as I stated in the introduction, I believe that the Egyptian civilization was fundamentally African, that the African element was stronger in the old and middle kingdoms before the Hyksos invasion than in later time, and than, later, than it later became. Furthermore, I am convinced that many of the most powerful Egyptian dynasties which were based in Upper Egypt, the 1st, 11th, 12th, and 18th, were made up of pharaohs whom one could usefully call black. This is Bernal, okay? He's the grandson of Alan Gardner who wrote the definitive work on Egyptian language. Now, he didn't have no choice. In fact, he left out. I'm gonna state, this is Bernal continuing. As I stated in the introduction, I believe that the Egyptian civilization was fundamentally African, that the African element was stronger in the Old and Middle Kingdoms before the Hyksos invasion than in later time, and than, later, than it later became. Furthermore, I am convinced that many of the most powerful Egyptian dynasties, which were based in Upper Egypt, the 1st, 11th, 12th, and 18th, were made up of pharaohs whom one could usefully call black. This is Bernal, okay? He's the grandson of Alan Gardner, who wrote the definitive work on Egyptian language. Now, he didn't have no choice. In fact, he even left out a few in between here. He got first, well, what about the fourth? And the, and the fifth, and the sixth, and, and go on and on and on and on. We move on. But the, here's the first, here's the first king to unite Egypt as a nation, King Mena. Many are also called Norma, who the Cretes copied when they called uh, 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 the island of Manoa, uh, the Manoan civilization, was named after this cat, Many, a Mena. You can see here, look at his nose and his lips here. No Charleston, Heston, Ewell Brenner here. We move on back. He said the first, 11th, 12th, 18th, go on, let's see. Here's a brother here from the sixth. He missed this one. This is Sahari, sixth dynasty. This is the one that Brother James put on the cover of Stolen Legacy. Stolen Legacy. Look at this one, 11th dynasty, Mentu Hotel. Saw it was black and said it was an artistic style. But the artist didn't bother to paint his eye black, left his eyes white too, right? In the back of the museum. In the back, that's right, brother. He's in the back of the museum, right? We're talking about 11th Dynasty here. Here's his, here's his daughter, this brother here. Here's his brother. I guess she's an artistic style, too, with a white woman fanning her. Fanning her in the back. This is 11th Dynasty. We can't subject passion to reason. We're going to keep moving. We move on. We can see here's some women in his royal court. These are the women he was dating. Right here, look at the sisters here with the cornrows. Look at their lips and their noses here. These are women that he was dating in his royal court. Here's another sister here. Look at her. Very, very civilized act here. Look at her. You heard the British say sipping tea. Here she's sipping tea long before it was a Briton. Got a mirror here. Look at, got a mirror here to check out, to make sure that the, that the sister's doing this right. And look at how she pins the braids here, holds the braid that she does it in layers, just like you sisters do it. When you braid your hair in layers. Go to the my side. Look at the my side. Look at the pin here to hold the braid and braid it in layers. Same pen, same method. Look at the lips. Look at her lips. Ain't no different than the brothers here. Right off the walls. This is 11th Dynasty, 12th Dynasty. So Bernal didn't have no choice to say that usefully called black. Look at this, 11th and 12th Dynasty here. 
Look at the braids here. Look at the lips. Now, you know this lip go with this hairstyle. This hairstyle go with this lip. So you, if you want to find somebody, you want to find somebody to look like this, you can't go to, to uh, New Zealand. You can't go to, you got to go to South Central. Whether it's South Central Africa or South Central LA, you can see the brother here, right here in Africa, with the hairstyle, brother, like it came right off the wall. So we just being emotional here. We're trying to latch on to somebody else's civilization. Look at Armin Nimhead here, and it's like Bob Marley standing here. Look at his broad Nathan's jaw and lip. I mean, Bernard had no choice when he started looking at these 11th and 12th dynastic period pharaohs. Okay, we ain't through. We just getting warm here. So here's Bernard's grandfather, uh, uh, Alan Gardner. He writes about Amosi Nefertari. Special uh, prominence was here given to Queen Amosi Nefertari, uh, depicted for some unaccountable reason with a black com uh, continence, but also some, <laughs> some unaccountable reason. <laughs> the continence, well, that means demeanor or so aspect. He goes on to say, but also sometimes with a blue one, he tried to diffuse the thing. <laughs> if she was a daughter of Kamosi, she will have had no black blood in her veins. And even more important, he goes on to some crazy stuff. But here he is. You got one Egyptologist named Rawlinson who's writing before him was saying a woman was black, but an Ethiopian and not a nigger. And here he is saying that the woman wasn't even black. But she was black, but she wasn't black, but she was black, but wasn't black. <laughs> this is called psychopathic racism. We move on. So here the sister, the queen sitting here black. And in the museum in, in, in New York, they said that the, the sister turned black over time. She's the only one. That's what it said. I was trying desperately to find a quote. I couldn't find it for this lecture. I, I hate I couldn't find it. If you could see it, I died when I saw that. She said she. She turned black over time. She's the only one in the picture to turn black over time. <laughs> time picked her to turn her black. <laughs> but this is, why, this is why they had to deny the sister. Because here you can see Omosi. Here you can see Omosi. And uh, Omosi Nefertari where uh, she became the ancestors of the entire 18th dynastic period. And you can see Amenhotep the first, Amenhotep the second, Thotmosis the first, on down to Hatshepsut, Thotmosis the third, all the way down to King Tut Ankhamun and Akhenaten, Amenhotep the third, Queen T. All these kings and queens are going back to this woman, this black Ethiopian woman. So let's chase this thing. Here's Hatshepsut. You saw her name on there. They knocked her face out. But what did Hatshepsut do? Hatshepsut built this particular palace in the cliffs by a brilliant architect, Simmud, who emulated Imhotep in many, res in many respects. And in this particular temple, she wrote about her ancestral land. And she sent an a expedition down to the land of Punt, as you see here, Punt, in dead Central Africa. And she said that she sent, the, she, 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 she sent ships down here and brought back trees, fragrances, gold, and even some people came back. Animals, the first zoos in Kemet, were sent down here by the Kemetu and brought back to Kemet. We move on, we can see here, and Scott Wall D. Lubis in the book called uh, uh, Sacred, sacred science writes, the following royal, talking about this procession here, following the royal, following the royal offerings come the solemn pro procession called the coming forth of men. During this ceremony, the statue of the netter is carried on a shield with two feathers on his head and with seals and mummy swaths around his neck. A white, a white bull precedes the statue while the re reader priest declaims the dance hymn of men and the black man of punt extols this netter. Egyptologists are at a loss to justify the presence of a black man from Punt among the important personalities of this ceremony. But geographical and historical explanations can be of no value on this subject. <laughs> so he, they just ignored a brother here, extolling the god men, who the men said he came from Punt. The, the god came from Punt. He's extolling the Punt, and the Egyptologists are at a loss to explain it. I'm showing you some of the racism that exists in the text as you begin to study. Petri digs up and said that the goddess Hathor, the most important mother goddess besides Isis, came from Punt. And that Isis herself, uh, I, uh, further Isis, who was identified as Dendra with Hathor, is said Isis was born in the ism of Dendra of Ap, the great one of Ap, the temple of Ap, under the form of a woman black and red. This points to a southern origin. Petri even shows that, the, that Hathor and Isis are coming from the south. The main gods and goddesses of Egypt are all coming from the south, 
People are black back there, but the Egyptologists are saying that these are just white people with black skin. <laughs> so Hatshepsut said that the, the beards that they wore, the divinity beards that they wore came from the land of Punt. She carved it on her temple. So here you can see the brother in the land of Punt still with the <laughs> divinity beard here. Here you can see on the temple where Queen Hatshepsut carved the brother. Look at his lips. Look at his nose. Show the divinity beard, clearly showing you the brother in the land of Punt. Then you go to National Geographic, and this is what happened to the brother. Look what happened to the brother here in National Geographic. We go on, look at the brother. The brother like the sister, baby got backs. The brother, the brother, the brother like the sister here with the C-topic gene condition. And they showed the sister on the wall. And you can see here the braided hair, the black skin, clearly showing these are Africans. This is what you'd anticipate on the African continent. But National Geographic, look at the sister here. Look what he did to the sister. Got the sister here, the Egyptians, here, look here. That's Central African punt. The Egyptians come and they white. The punites, they white. The dog white. Everything is white. And they're Central Africa. <laughs> Having a meeting in their Central Africa. <laughs> so you can see Hatshepsut here. Hatshepsut. Going down a little further. Let's go down a little further and see who else we can find. Here you can see Thotmosis III here. The brother's still looking African. Ain't changed. We're just going down the bloodline here. Here he is here. Thought most of the third. Who, is, who does he have? Amenhotep the second. Thought most of the fourth. Going down. Let's find on Amenhotep the third and T to see if they're still black. We move on down. Here's Queen T. Look at Queen T right here. Queen T. You see, ever seen white folks look like that before? Let's go on. Let's look at look at that profile like they do in jail. You know when they do the mug shots. <laughs> look at the mug. Look at the sister here. Looks like your auntie. Look at her. We move on. Look at the. Here she is. With her husband. Look at, she looks like him, he looks like her. They haven't changed, still African. Started with Amosi Nefertari, they haven't changed yet, have they? Have they changed yet? We keep moving. Let's go see, look at, uh oh. There's my wife, she looks just like them. Look, look at him, her, her, him, him, her. They all look the same. <laughs> they haven't changed, my wife hasn't changed, thank God. <laughs> look at her lips. They can change lips and not miss them. The eyes are the same. The only thing missing is the nose. That's one of the things they always did is knock the noses off. Look at the ones in the back. So you wouldn't really know or discern that these were ancient Kemetu. Just knock the Africans. Just knock the noses off. Fortunately, Sherry's nose is still intact. <laughs> so these are the ones you see in every book on Egypt. You see about three or four of these in every book. No, it's not a single, no gold chain. You know how much brothers and sisters like gold chains and stuff? They don't have no hat, no gold chain, nothing. But you see in the next to the pyramid to make you think through association that they built the pyramid. But here you can see the crown of the pharaohs here on these, showing that these were the kings who ruled Kemet. The Punites from the dynastic land that, that uh, Petri talked about that came down from the south. We move on, we can see here, we're going on down, we ain't stopping yet. We got uh, Queen T, we got her wrapped up. Now we're going down to Akhenaten, her son. Go to his son, look at his lips and his nose, that's her son. They saw him and said he was deformed. That's what they said about him. Said the brother was deformed. He had a glandular disorder. I guess we all got disorders in the glands here tonight. But anyway, here he is, and here's his nephew. Or they're still not sure what he is, but King Tut, the boy king, took the crown. He took the crown after he left the throne. And this is him. Look at his lips and his nose. So all the way going back to El Mosi, we see the brothers haven't changed. But yet they tell us that we are out wild-eyed Afrocentrists trying to latch on to somebody else's history. Now, if I can't latch on to that, I can't even latch on to my own daddy. Right. <laughs> so it's Charleston Heston, Ewell Brenner, Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> and the golden, what is it, whatever it is, the, showing the ancient Egyptians as being white, that has got a... Well, here comes a brother from South Central, when Harvard wouldn't do it, when Yale wouldn't do it, when Princeton wouldn't do it, Morehouse wouldn't do it, brother had to do it, had to take you through the bloodline to show you that these are Africans, but we ain't playing in here. These are Africans. We're talking about an African civilization here. And ain't no white boy on this planet can refute anything I show you here tonight. Nothing. I've been to Berkeley, Riverside, UCLA, SC, I've been to all these schools. Can shut up. They never say. See the pyramid right here. 
Africans built these pyramids. No Jews, no white folks. Africans built the pyramids. Are we in agreement here today? Yeah. Yeah. Africans built these temples. Africans built these temples. Are we in agreement here today? Yeah. Africans built these gates. And when Homer came in here and wrote in his Iliad Odyssey, he called it the city of a hundred gates because he saw the hundred gates here in Thebes. And here you can see the Romans copied the gate, we call it a triumphal arch, just copied the gate, went, looked at the gate, saw the gate, and copied the gate, and called it a triumphal arch. That's all they did. We're talking about the African origin of Western architecture. The, the Aponte Guard, they talk about Roman arches. Arches, arches, arches. Romans and arches. Arches, Romans, Romans, arches. Arches, arches. Got arches all over Kemet. Arches everywhere you can find arches. We had arches. We didn't even use some of the arches. And they, all they talk about is Roman arches. They use these arches just to store stuff under. So why do they use our symbols if we never did anything? Why do they use our symbols if we never did anything? His brother Rolando, brother, been working with me for 10 years. He's pointing, he's saying, are y'all ready to unlock the secrets of Washington, D.C. and the architecture of the U.S.? Are y'all ready to go home? Well let's, well, let's turn this thing off and get to the second part here. No, brother, you can keep it right here, no problem. So here at the Temple of Aset on the island of Philae, where they built a temple devoted to the goddess Isis, or Aset, in this particular site, as I said, Imhotep received a, a, a book, which he called the Book of Foundations, that came down from heaven, given to him from the god Ptah. And so in this particular book, all the structures throughout Kemet were based upon the foundation book written by this brother, uh, Imhotep. And on this particular island, when they developed this temple for the goddess Aset, or Isis, they even in front of this particular temple here, develop a small temple in dedication to Imhotep, the brother who wrote the Book of Foundations for the foundation of this entire temple and all the temples throughout Kemet. We can go on, we can see the small floor plan of the small temple here, of Imhotep's temple on the island of Philae, dedicated to this multi-genius. It is in this particular temple that many people became, when they became ill and could find no cures for them, they would come to this particular temple and they would go inside the temple all the way to the back. And they would lay in the temple at night and they would dream. And after, in the morning when they came forth with their dreams, the priests would interpret their dreams and develop uh, ways to cure their diseases, which they call incub incubation. Sometimes you hear about that, incubation chambers. Sometimes they speak to that with regard to the Greek gods and deities. But long before the Greek gods and deities in Kemet, we had incubation chambers where people had their dreams interpreted. You even remember the story of Joseph, who was interpreting dreams for the Pharaoh, where well, they just ripped us off on that one. But that's another story for the other lecture that I mentioned before. But here you can see the small temple devoted to Imhotep here. Around the wall, you can see the brother here. We're always knocking the faces out, chiseling away the faces, so you couldn't see that these are African people. Trying to destroy and deface the monuments so we wouldn't know the history of our people so that people could say that they were, our, that they were the developers of this civilization and not Africans. But you can see again Imhotep with his long head and his lips looks like any brother out on the court playing some round ball, Michael Jordan, or whoever you see out there on the streets, brother, at the playground. Looks like anybody else you see in the hood, right here in Inglewood or anywhere else you go. M Hotel. We move on. When Herodotus came into Kemet, Herodotus came into Kemet 450 years before the Christian era. 400 years BCE. 400 years BCE, Herodotus saw the Egyptians were still black. The Egyptians at that time were under Persian occupation. Herodotus was a subject of the Persian Empire. He didn't have to write the Egyptians were black. The Persians who were considered to be Semitic people, if they were Semitic people, the Egyptians, he would have been able to discern and differentiate the Egyptians from the Semitic peoples. So he was with the Persians when he came in there, and he said that they were black people. So why did these scholars not understand that? Why don't they teach this? Because this is why, because Herodotus went on to say the names of nearly all the gods came to Greece from Egypt. I know from inquiries I have made that they came from abroad, and it seems most likely that it was from Egypt, for the names of all the gods have been known in Egypt from the beginning of time. We move on, we can see here, Egypt and the rise of Greece. Hey, brother. Do you have another tip? Yeah, sure. Just get it on, okay? Don't worry about this. You can see the Egypt and the rise of Greece. Again, they forgot about all the stuff I showed you, all the faces we went through step by step. These are the people, I'm not going to let up off these folks because they're writing all these damn articles and magazines 
talking about how emotional we're doing, how we've been. But you don't see, there ain't no cameras here tonight. They're over at the, over at the, uh, at the, uh, uh, at the entertainment complex uh, interviewing Diana Ross, and interviewing uh, the Jacksons and all these other people about Malcolm X. They're not in here to interview a brother whose life was turned around by this brother. A brother who flunked the third grade, the teacher said, that never amounted to being anything. And after I read Malcolm X's autobiography, I changed my GPA from a, from a, from a, from a F and D student to a 3.5, almost a 3.5, almost damn near made Phoebean by the time I graduated from Crenshaw High School because I read Malcolm X. And they out there interviewing Diana Ross about Malcolm X. She ain't even read the book. If she had, she didn't learn nothing from it. They need to be in here interviewing us so we can show them what they're missing out on. When Malcolm wrote the book, he wrote a book Malcolm X on Afro-American history. I read it when I was 16 years old. I was walking around Crenshaw High School with a briefcase full of books on Malcolm. Back in high school, I was writing papers on Malcolm. I had a white teacher that I wrote about them white folks so bad, and she just, she kept, I couldn't understand why she kept giving me A's, but I kept writing about them. I wrote how they killed and murdered for the love of killing and murdering. And I documented it with their own books and with Malcolm. This is what I wrote about with Malcolm, constantly. And I found later that the, white woman, her husband was attorney for the Black Panthers. She didn't tell me that after, she didn't tell me that after the semester was over with. I was wondering what was wrong with her. But Malcolm changed my life, resurrected me from the dead, Malcolm. And so uh, he's got these Negroes out here who can't stay out of bed with white folks interviewing them about Malcolm. They need to come in here and interview some of y'all about Malcolm. That's right. We move on, we can see here, the Herodotus said the two black women who they called doves actually founded the Kemetic civilization. Two black women found the Oracle Dodona. He described these women as being black, as these doves as being black, because you know the dove in nature is usually white. So he, the reason he described the doves as being black, because they were black women from Egypt that found the first Oracle in Greece. We move on, we can see he went on to say, this is what Herodotus is writing in the face of all this stuff. In the face of all these Persians, he's writing this. The, now he's talking about a colony of blacks that is far up as the Black Sea, way up into Russia. Blacks, e Egyptians up in Russia. This is what Herodotus writes about them. The Egyptians did, however, say that they thought the original Colossians were men from Sesostris' army. And that's brothers of the 12th dynastic period. You saw those black faces from the 12th dynasty. He goes on to say Sesostris' army. My own idea on the subject was, was, was based first on the fact that they what? They have what? Black skins and woolly hair. Not that that amounts to much as other nations have the same. <laughs> well, it's true. You had India and other places where they had black skin and woolly hair also. But he saw that these were black skin, woolly hair people in Colossians. He wanted to say, and secondly, and more especially, on the fact that the Colossians, the Egyptians, and Ethiopians are the only races which from ancient times have practiced circumcision. So he said not only were these people the same anatomically, but culturally, ceremonially, ceremonially they were the same. This is how he, this was a very scientific conclusion that this man reached. This was a rational mind that he, when he, when he, was in a, he was in a rational state when he reached this conclusion. You can see clearly here, he's looking at the black folks, they looking at him, he said they black, and that was it. He move on, here's Herodotus right here, he's white. Nobody can deny that. Is he white? Is he not? Is he white? Is, her, is he white, Herodotus white? So when Herodotus looked at here at Amenem Het, he could see that Amenem Het wasn't white. He could see that. He looked at himself in the mirror and saw what he looked like, and he looked at the brother here, and he wrote what he saw. He saw that they were black, and he wrote it. So why can't the archaeological scholars and the, the university professors write what Herodotus wrote? Uh, white folks and Arabs. But here you can see another white one. This is when the, the, the whites came in to rule Egypt, under Ptolemies and Romans. You can see that they're white here, so you can see this one don't look nothing like this one. So what is this? If these are not the same, if this is, if this is not, if this is a white person, then what is this? It's black. Why can't these scholars see that? So what did Homer say? Homer said, we saw Herodotus, 450 years BC. Here's Homer, 800 BC. He's before Herodotus. He's writing about the Nile. He said, so I, so I returned to the heaven-fed waters of the Nile, where I moored and made the proper ritual offerings. And after appeasing the deathless gods, built a mound of earth to the everlasting memory of Agamemnon. When all this was done, I set out for home, and the immortals sent me. So here you got a Greek, Homer, 
who said he went to the what? To the heaven-fed waters of the Nile. He's saying that the Nile come from heaven. Isn't that what I said the Egyptians said? That the land of Punt was heaven, the Tadnet of God's land, and this is where the Nile source was? So the Greeks knew that. Homer knew that 800 years before the Christian era. Man, this is something. We move on. So here you can see at one time they considered the entire continent of Africa to be Ethiopia, which means black face. Ethos means burnt, oaks means face, black face. So Egypt was on the, on the continent of the black faces. Right here, Egypt and Ethiopia. We move on, we can see here. Now here, this goes back to about 1,550 years before the Christian era. 1,500 1,500 to 1,600 years before the Christian era, the earliest high culture in Europe on the island of Crete, they had a picture of Zeus, Zeus back to back with the Ethiopian. Here he is back, Zeus here with the beard, back to back with the Ethiopian. You say, wow, brother, why do they have an Ethiopian there with Zeus? Well, you got to understand that the Ethiopian represents Amun. Amun was the black god, the god of Kemet. So Zeus was a copy of Amun. That's why they put Zeus back to back with Amun. So let's go to the text. Let's go to Homer and see what happened. Homer says about Poseidon. Now, you know Poseidon. That's Zeus' brother, the one in the ocean, the cat with the fork. Looks like Satan with the fork, with the long beard. <laughs> OK, that guy, Poseidon, however, was now going on a visit to the distant Ethiopians, the furthest outposts of mankind, half of whom live where the sun goes down, half where he rises. This is Zeus' brother, a god going to be with the, with the Ethiopians, just like Zeus here. You can see Zeus with the Ethiopian. So Poseidon gone. Now look at the Iliad. Here's Zeus. Zeus went yesterday on an ocean stream, or they all packing up here, on an ocean stream on a visit to the pious or religious Ethiopians for a feast, and all the other gods with him. But he will be back in 12 days, and then I will go at once to the brazen halls and make my prayers. I think I can persuade. So he wasn't going to make a prayer until Zeus got back, from, uh, from Ethiopia with the Ethiopians. So I had to look it up. I said, I couldn't believe what I'm reading here. So I went to Noah Webster. You know Noah Webster, he defines everything. So I said, let me look at Noah and see what Noah got to say about this thing. So Noah says Ethiopian, Athos. Ethiopian, literal, literally, literally, burnt face. Athen to burn old face. Mm. An inhabitant or a native of ancient Ethiopia, which included modern Abyssinia. They're not just talking about that little corner that they call Ethiopia today. That whole continent was Ethiopia, and Abyssinia was included in it. He goes on to say, Noah does, in a general sense, any African, a what? A Negro, a black man. So apparently, George Rollinson, when he saw Mosi Nefertari, and he said she was an Ethiopian with the finest black complexion, he didn't read Noah Webster, who said she was a Negro. He called her a nigger, said they called them niggers and everything else, but he didn't read this here. <laughs> This is Noah talking. So I said, man, you mean to tell me these are Negroes? I went back, I said, you mean to tell me that Zeus? And what did he say? And all the, all the gods went to, to on a picnic with some Negroes? <laughs> I couldn't believe this. Here's the gods of Greece. Now I understood this picture. Now I understood. Then they gone on a picnic with the Negroes, right here on the vase. Couldn't believe it. We move on. So this man, Sesostris, Sinusworth, was said to have colonized the entire Mediterranean world and even to establish the city of Athens. This is the Greek tradition. You got to read Diodorus. You got to read Plutarch. You got to read Herodotus. You got to read all these Odorises and see what's going on here. It's all there. But see, the modern scholars just ignore the classical writers. They just ignore them like they don't exist. So Sesostris colonized the entire Mediterranean world. Let's go look at it. Here's the island of Crete the uh, labyrinth at Knossos. This is the earliest high culture of Europe, off the coast of, Cre of Greece, Crete. So look at Crete. We go on, we can see this is the, the floor plan of the labyrinth here. And I want to direct your attention to this chapel right here. This is a, what, the most important chapel here. This is the initiation chapel right here. The main entrance you come through here, go in here, and you get initiated. Initiation chapel. Let's go here. See here? Temple of the goddess. They call it the temple of the goddess, the mother goddess, Isis, Hathor, the concept of the mother goddess originates in Egypt and Ethiopia. It comes to Greece. Now, the, the archaeologists are digging up in here, and this is what they found here. He says here, an Egyptian pot lid found in the enclosure suggests many possibilities. Perhaps the priestess 
were trading with Egypt, or perhaps the Egyptian visitor to Crete came to see the temple, uh, which, mu which must have ranked among the wonders of the Bronze Age world. Either way, there was contact between the temple of at Kenosis and Egypt in about 1620 BC. So they're finding artifacts in Crete, Egyptian artifacts in Crete, to establish what the classical writers have been saying all the time, that the ancient Egyptians came and colonized that particular land. But the scholars who wrote that article, they didn't read these books. They didn't read the classical writers. Apparently, they, maybe they did. They just ignored it. But here you can see on Crete, you can see the, uh, the processional where they're giving up offerings here with the libation vases here. The symbol here of the, of the uh, bull horns came from the concept of the, of the god Men. Men was called Men Kamutef, the bull of his mother. It's from that that you get the name Menefer. Menefer was the capital of Kemet in the north devoted to the god Ptah. It was there that the god, the king Menes, Amena, founded the dynastic period using this name Men as Menes. And so the Minoan civilization just even copied the symbols, the bull symbols, and even the name, as they call it Minoan. We move on, we can see here, right in Egypt, Rekmari's tomb, and under Thutmosis III. You can see here, that coming from the island of Crete, bringing these vases and bowls from Crete, this is on Egyptian tombs, showing the cup to. These are people who lived in the island of Crete, which the ancient Egyptians term. We move on, we can see here, right there on Crete, you can see the, the black and the white. They're clearly differentiating one from the other. On the bull, again, this is a symbol, this is an Egyptian symbol at this particular time. We move on, we can see here, over and over again, you can see the white people, you can see the black people, right there in Crete, on the island supporting the classical uh, view that the ancient Egyptians colonized the Mediterranean world. It's right there. All you got to do is go and look for it. Look at this. On the island of Crete. Look at the brother here. They're racing. They're running here. This is irrefutable. This is hard evidence, what we call hard evidence. This is not circumstantial evidence. This is hard evidence. This is Simmut's tomb. He's showing the Cretan bulls here bringing tribute to Egypt. Sinma in the 18th dynasty. So time and time again, there's no shortage of information, as you can see, showing you it. They even found a shipwreck off the coast of Turkey, an Egyptian sh shipwreck, which is the earliest found shipwreck off the coast of Turkey, where they found Egyptian bowls and vases and artifacts all in the, all in the bottom of the ocean here. We move on, we can see here with the cartouches going back to the 18th dynastic period. The Pharaoh Aknat and the Nefertiti, the cartouches found in the bottom of the ocean off the coast of Turkey. So is, am I just making this up? Is this my wild-eyed Afrocentric opinion? Am I unable to subject passion to reason? Or is it them, the ones who are unable to subject passion to reason? Is that a good question? Here you can see the shipwrecks found all over the place, artifacts that are coming from ancient Kemet. You can see off the coast of Turkey, island of Crete where they're finding these things that belong to the ancient Egyptian civilization. So here you can see Brother Jamal Gore, brother standing there in the Osirian stance, the way of the heart, the heart's on the left side of the body. The left foot forward represents the way of the God, the way of truth. So Brother Jamal standing in, in the form of truth, look at this, the Greeks just copied it. This is the first art, the first sculptures appear in Greece with the hands thrust to the side, the left foot forward, and even the braided hair where they're copying the Kemetic Canaan's here. The, fir the very first sculptures in Europe are copies of the Kemetic sculpture. The Greeks naked, huh? Yeah, naked Greeks, yeah. Here you can see even the very principles behind the mathematics, which we call the golden rule, they had Canaan's for, for mathematical control of the statuary, the Egyptians did. And so the Greeks just copied it. As they measured these statues, they found that they were identical to the Egyptian Canaan's. Just copying the stuff. They don't tell you this in the schools, in the high schools, junior high schools, colleges, universities, in these racist textbooks that they have in the schools. But James Henry Breasted, who was the founder of the, uh, of the School of Egyptology at the University of Chicago, which is the first school of Egyptology in America, the second being Harvard, founded by Henry Reisner, Breasted writes in his book uh, of uh, A History of European Civilization, he writes, Rise of Cretan Civilization under Egyptian influence. Because of their nearness to Egypt, because of their nearness to Egypt, it was on the Aegean, Aegean islands and not on the mainland of Europe that the earliest high uh, civilization on the north side of the Mediterranean grew up. From the beginning, the leader in this civilization of the Aegeans 
was the land of Crete. The little sun-dried brick villages forming the late Stone Age settlements of Crete received copper from the ships of the Nile by 3000 BC. So by 3000 BC, this is when the Hotep was on the scene. The ships from the Nile were traveling throughout the Mediterranean world. This is the archaeological evidence here that they seem to forget about. And here you can see here, at 3000 BC, Imhotep had already built this pyramid for the Pharaoh Zosa. You see they kind of lightened the brother up here. Got his hair a little straight here. Got the leopard skin here, like they do in the interior of Africa, but the brother don't reflect the, the, the leopard skin here. So nonetheless, you get the idea what it's taken. And so when they do this to our people, this is what we call the cultural genocide, not only in the black uh, African studies curriculum, but in the entire curriculum across the United States of America. We're talking about the cultural genocide. We're talking about the beating that we take in the history books like Rodney King uh, took in the streets of Los Angeles. We take the same kind of beating in the history book. No different. So here you can see the stones here at the tip of Horus and Edfu showing you that long before the Ptolemies built this particular temple that you had foundation stones that went all the way back to the ancient ancestors, Imhotep, and, la and in later periods such as the 18th and 19th dynastic period. Over and over again, the ancient Egyptians used stones from earlier temples to build a new temple because they believed in life uh, being perpetual and continuous. And so they would always use the older temples to give life to the new temples. And so in this particular temple, it's written in this temple that this temple was based upon the canons of Imhotep to go back to the Book of Foundations. It was founded on those particular principles and that the first temple of Edfu uh, here was designed by Imhotep himself. It's written in these temples. And you can see here are the stones, the foundation stones that they found from the earlier temples that went into the development of this particular temple here. We move on, we can see here, to go inside this temple was to go back to the primeval hill of the beginning. This represents, the high altar represents the primeval hill of the beginning. The papyrus, the, the, the papyrus uh, pillars here represents going back to the sud region of the interior of Africa where you have all the papyrus plants and lotus flowers. So to go into the temple was to go into heaven, was to go into the interior of Africa, was to go into the land of Punt, was to go into the Ta Neta, the God's land. When you come upon the primeval hill, shows the pyramid was a symbol was the design of the mountains in the interior of Africa. So to go into this temple was to go into the central portions of Africa. Now, I deal with this more in my other lecture. I'm not going to deal with it too much. I'm going to show you how this was replicated on the concept designed by Imhotep. Now, this building was designed by Imhotep. This is 3000 BC. This is 5,000 years ago that this brother designed a temple, a building like this. Look at the stone here, the stonework here. 5,000 years old. This is, the, this is a Saqqara complex. This is the main entrance. You enter this particular area, and you go into the uh, complex where there's a pyramid, that step pyramid that I showed you previously is inside this particular complex. So to go into this particular complex, you traverse this hall. This is very important because this is the first pillared hall, the first concept of a great hall. And so this particular Canaan, they passed on through all the architecture throughout the foundations of, of Kemetic history from the beginning where Imhotep designed this hall right through the 30 dynasties of Kemetic history. We go on, we can see here the great temple of uh, apet Raset, uh, the temple of Amun here. This is a, a, as opposed to the temple of apet Raset, which is the temple of Luxor, which is the temple of Karnak. This is the temple of Luxor. You can see the great hall here. This goes all the way back to this Canaan developed by Imhotep of having the great hall to go back to the interior of the temple, which represents going back to the primeval hill of the beginning. You can see again the hall of Imhotep, which became the, the paradigm, the antecedent for the modern temples that they, as they built them later, such as the great temple of Karnak, which we call Waret. Again, this great hall here, going back to Imhotep, this is the first concept of a cathedral, of a basilica. Here you can see the clear story lights here above, where you have the light come down in here to light the interior of the temple. You see the columns on the side here to, to support this, and the columns in the center here. This is a cathedral. This is a basilica. We go to Rome, look at this. They just copied this. Look at the lights here and the columns on the side. Look at the lights here and the columns on the side. The first cathedrals and basilicas are designed right here in Kemet. We move on, look at Ramazim here. Look at the lights here. The first cathedrals here. Who told you we had cathedrals in Kemet, in Africa? Anybody ever tell you that? Huh? We said we're dealing with the with Imhotep and the African origin of Western architecture. Yeah, brother, that's what they told us. But look here. Look at the clear story light. Look at the cathedral going all the way back to the first, uh, the earliest periods, the first and through third dynasty, coming on through the fifth, 1300 B.C., 
the great temple of Amun and Karnak here. The Ptolemies copied that, the Greeks copied it here, and later on the Romans copied it, and then the church got it later. The evolution of the cathedral going back to Kemet. Here you can see as you enter that hall, again you see the pyramid here represent the primeval hill of the beginning. Again, this is the book of foundation that Imhotep used uh, when he wrote this particular Canaan, which became universal throughout Kemetic history, and even in the church today. Here you see the Mastaba tomb. One time the Egyptians built Mastaba tombs, which were flat tombs. It was Imhotep who advanced this concept. As you see the Mastaba tomb here on the inside, which is a flat tomb. He later began to stack these Mastaba tombs, and eventually came up with the concept of the step pyramid. And from this particular pyramid, all the pyramids of Egypt began to become developed based upon the Canaan's found, uh, developed by Imhotep 3,000 BC, 5,000 years ago. This brother was, was brilliant. This was a genius, and he was an African. It's important to note that he was an African. We move on, we can see he designed the peephole. You can look through the hole, to the door. You can see the king Zoser, who he designed that temple for. Clearly, you can see the brother's lips here, back here. Zoser was African, just like the architect, Imhotep. We move on, we can see that here, that on the temple of Sedai One, where Isis is raising the symbol of Osiris, the symbol of resurrection. Osiris was the first resurrected god in history. We're not going to talk about that today. We'll talk about it on the next lecture. But nonetheless, you can see that Pharaoh Zoser intended to resurrect from the dead because he had the symbols of, of Osiris, the jed pillar, the backbone of Osiris, in his tomb designed by Imhotep. Now, what do you notice about this also, besides the design? Hey, brother, brother lays towel in here. Brother's a towel setter. Here's a ceramic towel here. Imhotep, he's a marble setter. Here's a ceramic towel. Principles the same, just different material. Here you can see the, the, the ceramic towel. Imhotep designed a ceramic towel. Imhotep designing ceramic towel. I wonder if the Ceramic Towel Institute is teaching that. Imhotep is designing ceramic towel. They ain't teaching that, are they, brother? Ceramic towel, your kitchen. Go wipe your kitchen sink today and think about Imhotep. Look at the ceramic towel all around the Pharaoh Zoser as he's doing the dance here at his head said fest ceremony. Ceramic towel designed by Imhotep. This brother was a genius. He was coming up with all kinds of stuff. The Abbey of Westminster. Look at the Twin Towers here. They even stole that, which we call pylons we put in front of all of our temples. The Abbey of Westminster. Look at the great temple of Horus at Edfu. This was a concept and design that we put in front of all of our temples. They just ripped us off. George James called it a stolen legacy. Was George right? We have to ask the question, was George telling the truth when he called it a stolen legacy? We move on, we can see here, the Cathedral of Notre Dame as I compared with the Temple of Isis just ripped us off with this concept. We're talking about here the African origin of Western architecture. As you see the pylons here, but here you can see the design of the pylons. The design with the, with the slight angle on the structure here. Imhotep was the one that came up with that. Imhotep designed that first. You can see the Cavetto corners here at the top, the shape of the slant here with the slight uh, angle on it. This became a part of the, of the uh, New Kingdom architecture. This brother said, I said he wrote the book of foundation for architecture throughout Kemet and coming right down even to the church today. We move on, we can see here the various forms of geometry, the uh, arches, the columns, the vertical, the squares. Look at this, the curved surface here. The brother was a dynamic designer. This brother wasn't playing around. All these design courses. I saw this column here, I couldn't, I couldn't, I had to sit down and draw a picture and record this. I couldn't believe it. I wasn't expecting to walk up on this. Here what you see is a Doric column a fluted Doric column. They told us the Greeks, when I studied the history of architecture, they called it a Greek Doric column. Here at 3000 BCE, 2,500 years before the Greeks produced their first Doric column, 2,500 years before the Greeks produced their first Doric column, Imhotep had designed a fluted column. No, that's just Brother Mathieu trying to record the accomplishment of, of Brother Imhotep. Don't put me in that classification. That brother was a genius. I don't fit in that classification. We move on. We can see here the engaged fluted column here that Imhotep designed. The brother came up with the column. We move on. You can see here in the middle portion of, here, of Kemet at Beni Hassan, where the 12th dynasty, they were using fluted columns because Imhotep designed it. And look at the dentils of teeth going across the top. The first concept of an architrave in the frieze here. Look at they just ripped us off. Here's a capitol building in DC. Look at the little teeth here, the dentals with the column. 
They copied that right off of temples here. The first concept of dental. But the Bedouins. How many people have taken art history and architectural history? They never told you that the ancient Egyptians were doing dentals and fluted columns. We move on, we can see here Queen Hatshepsut. You remember that sister? The, you, see, you saw her temple. Look at the fluted columns here in the 18th dynastic period here. Long before there was a Greece. This is, this is a thousand years before Greece. We had, we had 2,500 years before Greece with Imhotep. We had uh, 1,500 years before the Greeks at uh, Beni Hassan. Now we got 1,000 years. How many more years do we want to go? Keep going. We move on. You can see here that the Greeks, 500 to 600 BC, began to build fluted columns. You can see the fluted columns here. We can see again where they stole this concept because they didn't say they got it from the Egyptians. Therefore, they stole it from the Egyptians. We move on. We can see here that now the barbarians are coming to see where their ancestors learned how to develop those columns. <laughs> right there in Kemet. I told them to look good, look good, because here you can see the door column. I told the cat, the cat looked up at the column. He had to concede. Yeah, this is a door column. So here you can see they said that they had developed all these motifs on here, on the capitals. You got the Doric column, the Ionic column, the Corinthian column. Man, we had Corinthian columns all over the place. We had papyriform columns, lotiform columns, papyriform columns. We had karyetic columns, any kind of column, Doric fluted column, any kind of column you want to. We were the first to come with an idea to put a floral arrangement on a column. How can they come up with this stuff saying that they were the originators of this stuff? Imhotep was the first to do that. You can see the fluted column with the flower on it, the leaf floating down on it. He's the first one to come up with that concept. And from that, it comes all the way down throughout the dynastic period of Kemet, from Imhotep. Talking about a multi-genius here. He can see the Egyptian bell column. And what does it say? Let's read alone. Evolution of the what? Corinthian capital. So here you can see the Corinthian capital and how it evolved from the Egyptian bell column. They never taught us this in the history of architecture. Look at the Doric temple here, the temple of uh, Athena here on the, the Parthenon, on the Acropolis. The Parthenon on the Acropolis. They said the, the Greeks were the first one to come up with a sublime sense of line and texture and style. And they superseded all that the ancient Egyptians and others had done. It was the first time that this style and grace was, uh, was uh, exhibited in architecture. Just lying to us. Look at this. The same concept of line and style, right here in the complex here of Hatshepsut and Mentu Hotel. The same idea of, uh, of layers and levels and the elements of verticals and horizontals. This concept is associated with design. was supposed to represent the pinnacle of design right here in Kemet, a thousand years before they came up with the idea. We ain't done yet. Let's keep moving here. So here you see the Lincoln Memorial as we get ready. We kind of wind this up here. We get to the Lincoln Memorial here. Now you look at the Lincoln Memorial, and you think about it, it as a Greek temple. But we call this type of temple Mamisi House, which means birth house. It was a single cell in the middle, surrounded by columns on the front flank and, and rear of the temple. That was what a, that's what a Mamisi birth house was. So the, the Lincoln Memorial, and you see here, the, uh, again, the Scottish Rite Temple, where here's just an extension of the same concept, Lincoln Memorial, with the pyramid on top of it. Now you can see what I was talking about when the Masons knew it. But you didn't know it till the brother from South Central came down. The brother from South Central is showing you that he started with Imhotep, the pyramids, where he designed all these different columns, and now the Greeks and the Romans have got it from him. Are we in agreement here today? So we go to Mentu Hotep's complex here. I so said we go to Mentu Hotep's complex here. We go to Mentu Hotep's complex here. <laughs> We go to Mentu Hotep's complex here. You see the columns all the way around here. We were building single cells surrounded by columns going back 3,000 years before the Greeks had an idea. And this is the, the built the pyramid in case we forgot that we were dealing with black kings. I wanted to remind you, take your mind back to the brother again to reemphasize that this is what the brother built here in the cliff. Next to Queen Hatshepsut's temple. And you can see, again, these are 12th and 11th dynasty pharaohs. We're talking about Amenemhet head again. This is the time they were building these, these things in the cliff. This is who was building them, these cats. So um, wait a minute. I want you to look good at those lips and that jaw and that nose. You see that nose is knocked off there. That's right. Here you can see, again, the temple of Mentuhotep, again, the columns here, designed in the cliff. You can see from above the single cell, the pyramid in the middle, surrounded by columns. 
And even on the lower level down below, it was also surrounded by columns. Single cell surrounded by columns all the way around. But yet the Greeks were supposed to be the first one. Not only that, but look at the columns that surrounded it. They were fluted columns, uh, so-called proto-Doric columns, so-called proto-Doric columns. And you can see here, I had to do this on a computer since white folks wouldn't do it. I decided I'd do it. Proto-Doric column. Mentuhotep used a six, eight-sided octagonal columns, and then Queen Hatshepsut later advanced it to 16 sides on the columns and surrounded the single cell by the columns on the outside. So when the Greeks came in there in the Kemet, as we have evidence that they came in, we see evidence that they came into the projects of Elahun and also at Dasher and several other places where the Greeks had come in and worked on projects. So they had to come in and see it. It was right there when they came and worked. Again, it had shipped us the fluted columns here. I mean, we got flutes. You just name it. Where you want to find a flute? We'll show it to you in Kim. The flute's right here on this level of this temple here. This is Hat Shepsut next to Mentuhotep's temple. He had flutes on this side. She had flutes on this side. She had levels. He had levels. Then the Greeks come up saying that they developed levels, sense of lines, flutes, uh, uh, capitals, and all the rest of this stuff. We're talking about African people. Sinmut, this brother here, designed this temple for Hat Shepsut. She loved this brother here. He led an expedition personally into Punt to bring the trees back for the queen, him and another brother named Nahisi. Nahasi, or Nahasi. Nahasi means black. Him and Nahasi, his name is Sinmut. He's named after an island in Nubia. His name is, he's named after an island in Nubia. These are black people we're talking about here. I mean, you look at one look at his face, and there's no uncertain terms what the brother is. He's the designer of that complex. Now, how many of you heard about Sinmut? A Bach and Cone soon for Ramesses II and May for Ramesses II. And an architect named Beck for uh, Akhenaten. They got the names, they just don't tell us about the names. So the fundamental concept, you know, the Greeks are the ones that argued about forms. You know, you remember Plato and Socrates, they talk about form. You took philosophy about form. You can say all chairs have a form, but no chair meets that form, but you can tell it's a chair because of the form, all the stuff that they talk about. Well, let's look at the temple here. We, the temples have forms too, don't they? Okay, let's look at the forms. We're dealing with squares, circles, and triangles. So the Greek temple composed of triangles, circles, and squares. So the, the, the Egyptian Mamisi temple was composed of squares and circles. Triangles, we had pyramids, triangulation. You saw the mathematics. So the Greeks came in, saw triangles, saw circles, saw squares, and built this. Built this. That's what they built. A single cell surrounded by columns on all four sides. Everybody with me? Here's a Mamisi house. This is a bird house. A single cell surrounded by columns on all four sides. All they did was put an A on top of the thing and squared the corners right here. And this is what knocked the panels out, and that's it. Mamisi birth house. Oh, we're we going on. We ain't through here yet. The Temple of Elephantine, 1450 BC. The Greeks didn't even start building those things until about five, between five and 600 BC. We said 1450 BC, destroyed in AD 1822 was one of the so-called Mamisi temples, which consisted of a small chamber known as the birth house and sacred to the mysterious rites of the goddess Isis. This chamber with statue and altar surrounded by columns and, and approached by steps is sometimes regarded as the prototype of the later Greek temple. I said, brother, where'd you find that at? This is uh, Bannister Fletcher, the brother, that, not the brother, the white man that wrote the definitive book on architecture. All the major schools of architecture, UCLA, USC, Harvard, Princeton, they used Bannister Fletcher's book. He wrote it in Europe, in England. He was, the, uh, he was the leader of the Institute of Architects in England. Definitive book, and this is what he wrote. There was nothing but a replica of the Egyptian Mamisi house, the Greek temple. So here you can see the Mamisi house right here on the Temple of Isis on the island of Philae. Again, rivers were sacred. We're about to wrap this thing up. Rivers were very sacred in Kemet, this particularly the Nile River. You can see here that the temple island conditions was very sacred. The islands represent the primeval hill rising up out of, the, out of the waters of the creation. So this is why they put the Isis temple on this particular island. Also, it had implications for Ptah, and then you also found Imhotep's temple on the same island. Can you see how all this stuff ties in? You see all this stuff ties in? The Nile, the island, Imhotep, the architecture, all this stuff ties in. We're talking about a continuum here. So here you can see that the Egyptians built their temples off the, off the Nile, as it represented a continuation of the Nile. This is called a causeway uh, from the temple to the Nile River. You can see here from the platform here, the kiosk, you come out here, and you see at one time when the Nile would overflood, 
and before they built the Aswan High Dam, it would come right up to this particular area. So the boats would dock right here at this area. You could walk back to the temple. Okay, so you can see they built it perpendicular or parallel to the Nile. This was a basic Canaan in Egyptian architecture. We move on, we can see here the Great Temple of Amun and Karnak, reconstruction. As you see construction going on in the pylons here. Again, it's perpendicular to the Nile River. Again, you can see from the top of the Temple of Amun looking, you can see the Nile River here. Everybody with me? Perpendicular to the river. Again, you can see here, Hatshepsut's temple was on a direct axis to the Temple of Amun, right across. These temples all bear relationships here. Perpendicular to the river. Now we move on. Again, Hatshepsut's temple. Here's the river, perpendicular to the river. We move on. Here's the Vatican. What do you see here? Huh? 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 Oh, this is an accident, brother. Vitruvius, in his book, Marcus Vitruvius Polio, wrote in his book, The Ten Books on Architecture, that whenever we build religious buildings in Rome and Europe, we should do them the way the Egyptians do them, perpendicular or parallel to the river. That's what he wrote in his book, The Ten Books on Architecture. And they claim him and the Roman College of Architects were the fathers of modern architecture. He's a liar. Imhotep, in his book of foundations, is the foundation work for his book. But he didn't write about Imhotep in his book. He's a usurper. He took the information from Kemet and wrote his own foundation book. Here you can see the Westminster Abbey and Parliament and Big Ben sitting right off the river, the Thamus River, the Thamus River, which the Romans said Thame Isis River. The Romans who worship Isis in this site called the river Thame Isis. And you call it Thamus today. Right off the river here. Yeah, we going on here. Here it is. Look at it. Even got the Osiris' penis right here. That's right. Osiris was murdered and cut up into 14 pieces. Isis is long for his body. Looked for the 14 pieces, found all 14, all 13 pieces. Couldn't find one. The one she couldn't find was the male member, the phallic, or the penis. And she raised the obelisk or the ben, ben as a symbol of his assured resurrection. So George Washington got a penis right here in D.C. They got a height restriction of 13 stories in D.C. so that you can see this penis from any part of D.C. This is over 500 feet in height. So you can see this from any corner of D.C. because of the height restriction. This is called the, the uh, Capitol. This is Capitol Hill, the White House. Memphis was called the Double White House. We also had the Primeval Hill. The Primeval Hill, Waret, the Great Temple of Amun at Waret was called, Waret means the Light Mountain. That's what it represents, the Light Mountain. So here you see the Mammisi House, the Birth House, the Penis, the Hill, the, the White House. Come on, we're talking about some serious vandalism here. We're talking about some serious theft here. We ain't through yet. We're getting warm here. We're going to wind it down. We better finish with a finale. So Thomas Cole, we said Thomas Cole was sitting here looking at the temples, looking back, saying that the pyramids were first, the Mamisi birth house came, and the Roman and Greek temples had copied from that, and he's copying as he's building the churches today. Thomas Cole in 1840. But we're being emotional, and we can't subject our passions to reason. So here you can see Abe Lincoln owes his building to ancient Kemet. Right here, oh Abe, it owes, owes it to the Mamisi house. Didn't I tell you that a Mamisi house was the paradigm? It was the originator for that concept of the single cell surrounded on four, all four sides. We move on, we can see here's a Mamisi house right in the front of the Temple of Horus at Edfu. And I want to draw your attention to something that's phenomenal. And that is that on the top of the columns here, they got a little toit, which we call pygmy today, derogatory. They had a little toit on top of the birth house. Because the birth house was a symbol of the place where the gods were born. And every major site, which they called known, which there were 42 of the gnomes, there's a man mercy. A man mercy. Right here, O A. It's old, older to the Mamisi house. Didn't I tell you that a Mamisi house was the paradigm? It was the originator for that concept of the single cell surrounded on four, all four sides. We move on. We can see here's a Mamisi house right in the front of the Temple of Horus at Edfu. And I want to draw your attention to something that's phenomenal. And that is that on the top of the columns here, they got a little toit, which we call pygmy today, derogatory. They had a little toit on top of the birth house. Because the birth house was a symbol of the place where the gods were born. And every major site which they called known, which there were 42 of the gnomes, there's a, Mamers a Mamisi birth house which symbolized the place where that god for that particular gnome was born. Whereas at the temple of Isis, Isis was born in that house. Whereas at the temple of Hathor, 
Hathor was born in that house. Where it's the temple of Asar, Asar was born in that house. At each site that you had a netter, which they called gods, there was a mamisi devoted to the birth of that god. And that mamisi symbolized the interior of Africa, where the gods came forth. And where the Pygmies and Twa live in the forest region today, and they could watch Osiris and do the dance before Osiris' great throne, which they saw as being in the interior, interior of Africa, which they called Ta Netter, the God's land. This is why they put the little Twa's on top of the collar. You see the little Pygmies on top of the collar. The sail in the center represents the primeval hill, rising up out of the waters full of papyrus plants and thickets, the place where the God could seek sanctuary from the elements. This was the first concept of a sanctuary, a theological place for learning. This is where it comes from. Europeans can't explain this stuff. They got columns in their temples, columns around their temples. They ain't got no papyruses and lotus flowers over there, up on Mount Olympus. So this is the first great architect, the woman, the sister. She is the immaculate conceived one. She is the first one on the earth. We believe Africans believe the woman was first. Ain't no rib, ain't no scar on your side was showing no rib where you came from, no rib or something. You got a navel, a, a biblical cord to show you came from your mama. You can't do without your mama. You got to have this. You got to have this. You can't live without that, male and female. So why God going to put you here first, and then you don't have no mama to suckle on? You see what I'm saying? So the first concept of God, as recorded by our ancestors, was that of a female. They saw the heaven, new, as a heaven, giving birth to the sun, the stars. That, the universe is feminine by principle. The dark abyss of the universe giving birth to stars, suns, and moons. Giving birth. That's feminine. So the first concept of an architect was the little twa. Best Horace was an anthropomorphic form, both male and female. But because she bore the first child, the first immaculate conception, and she had the natural inclination and love for the child to build a het, a hut. The Egyptians call hut netter. The word hut comes directly from hut netter. That's what they call the place of the God, the house of the God, hut netter. So she built the first hut netter out of reeds. So that's what that thing represented, the Mamisi house. This is the Mamisi house. This is the birth house. Now with the mitochondrial DNA studies and Richard Leakey letting it leak out, we know that the birth house of mankind was the interior of Africa. So the birthplace of mankind was the Mamisi house. This is the Mamisi house. The Nile River at its beginning at the headwaters around the Great Lakes where the primeval hill is, that's the Mamisi house. That's the place where the gods are born. That's the place where the first people were born. And from there, they migrated out all over the world. This is the birth house. And so when you see uh, uh, the, the Lincoln Memorial, you see that this is located off the Potomac River, just like the Nile River, perpendicular, with the Mamisi house here. The Canopus, or reflecting pool, which represents the Nile River. You see the penis of Osiris symbolizing resurrection, because this is where all this took place in the central portions of Africa. This is where resurrection took place. This is where the birth, her, birth house took place. This is the place of the beginning. And they believe the souls return back to the beginning for judgment. They just copy this stuff right off the walls here. Birth of a nation. We move on. We can see here that even in Roman times, they built the same thing. This is a temple of Isis for Hadrian's villa. He built the Canopus or a sacred lake that leads back to the temple of Isis and Serapis right here. The uh, DC architects copied that. The Canopus leads back to the, Ma the Mamisi birth house. You can see here, this is the Mamisi house built by Emperor Hadrian. This is long before George Washington them got an idea. We move on, we can see here, you can see uh, the, the uh, Canopus or the Nile flowing back to the birth house, to the Mamisi house, with Lincoln sitting up in there, freeing the slaves, the, the people who designed the thing. They said uh, the Negroes had no history of being architects. We go on, we can see here is Hadrian's birth house, as you see the Canopus leading back to the Temple of Isis. This is the Temple of Isis back here. This is where they're getting it from. So this Roman built the temple to Isis and put the Nile. Look at the crocodiles here. The crocodile symbolized the Nile. This represented the Nile. We go on, we can see here the crocodiles at Hadrian's Villa, representing the Nile. The temple of Isis built by the Romans. Now check this out. This is a Masonic ceremony. This is when they built the Mamisi House, the Lincoln Memorial. This is what they did out front. Henry Bacon, Lincoln Memorial, Henry Bacon's masterpiece. The Lincoln Memorial was a, a hit from the first and be, from the Lincoln Memorial was a hit from the first and has become even more so with the passing years. So impressive uh, were his uh, fellow architects, so impressed were his fellow architects that they staged his dedication like a latter day grand opera, which might have been composed by Richard Wagner, 1813, so forth. 
uh, it began on May 18, 1923, during the uh, convention of the convention of the American Institute of Architects (AIA), with an annual, annual banquet at, at tables along the reflecting pool in front of the memorial. At the end of the banquet, as the architect and their guests stood alongside the reflecting pool, a decorated barge. Now the barges were they, in Egypt. They were selling the guys up and down Egypt in the barges. So in the barge, with a great yellow sail drawn by ropes by architectural stu architecture students, slowly made its way towards the memorial, which was illuminated from within with violet uh, colored lights. At the foot of the memorial waited officers and former officers of the AIA bearing uh, colorful banners. Waiting with them were the President of the United States, Warren G. Harding, and uh, the former President, William Howard Taft, and the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, with uh, standing between incense blazing uh, brazers. Now, all these cats were Freemasons. I support all of that. They were all basically Freemasons. So they're standing in front of this temple doing an Egyptian ceremony right in front of the temple. It goes on and says, on the barge were the architect Henry Bacon and the sculptor, and the sculptor Daniel Chester French and members of the U.S. Marine Corps band, all dressed in colorful medieval cloaks illuminated by what was called the fire of inspiration. You saw the fire off the, the library we were talking about the fire of inspiration coming to the Lincoln Memorial. Move on, it says that uh, after, after disembarking from the barge, Henry Bacon received from the President Harding the gold medal of the American Institute of Architects and its guest of honor, uh, its, guest of, its greatest honor for an architect. The memorial was dedicated as a national shrine at that particular point. So the diameter of your knowledge is equivalent to the circumference of your activity. I hope that some, tonight we have circumscribed enough information to help everyone grow here today. And it all goes back to this brother, Imhotep, and the African origin of Western ar architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess we'll take about 10 minutes worth of questions. Right?